viewing a message from the pulpit of Rolling Hills Church, located in Verona, Pennsylvania. We're glad that you could join us as we open up the Word of God. And I pray that we would all have that same kind of courage to speak the things about God that Stephen did, that our church, our neighbors, our city, our state, our country, our world would be so much different if we would just be willing to courageously speak the gospel of Christ in the people's lives. special. I actually made this yarn out of fiber. I spun it around in circles a bajillion times and it became yarn. Now some people think if you take all the ingredients to make something, so in this case, this is approximately how much yarn it would make to make a little heart. Isn't that cute? cute. I hang these all over my Christmas tree. So this is about what it would take to make a heart. I'm gonna put that in here. I'm gonna shake it up. And the heart's gonna come out, right? All right, ready for this? Oh. There's a reason for this. Most of you know it. Can you just put all the ingredients for a cake in a bag and get, no. a, get a cake? Yes. <laughs> I have something in here. This is knitted, and it's a little scarf, and it's black and gold for like the penguins or the Steelers or the penguins. How did you make that? It was knitted. This is a hat, and I'm actually kind of warm right now, so I'm not going to put it on. But it was also knitted. It was knitted on a loom. It's called loom knitting. How big it gets? Big enough to fit on my head. Now, don't be grossed out. I've got some socks in here, but they're clean. <coughs> These are socks that my mom made me. They've got lace on them. They are, and they're green, which, if you remember, is my favorite color. The moral, makes with the moral of the story is Anna's favorite color is green. <laughs> These ones, these have the little zigzag pattern on them. And these ones have stripes. Now, there's something special about these ones. And that is, there's a little hole in it. And a hole that I put there. Because sometimes things get rough. You guys ever get holes in your socks? I get holes in my socks all the time. But unfortunately, this hole is in a very special sock. Luckily, though, the person who made it knows how to fix it just haven't gotten it to her yet. Almost done. Look how beautiful that is. Isn't that gorgeous? It's a shawl and it's got little beads in it. So when my mother made this for me, she had to count exactly how many beads she would need ahead of time, then put it on the yarn, and then do all the knitting, and at the very end, put them on. Very exacting work. And one more. This is also a shawl. What color is it? Green. That's my favorite. It's called a hitchhiker. It's got little points on it. It's got 42 points on it. I could tell you the story as to why later, but it's got to do with Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Now, in here, I have my knitting project right now. Some of you may have seen me knitting in my seat before. 
This is a slightly different one. This one is all knitting. Knit, 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 knit. And you can't just sit down and shake up the yarn and make it work. You have to know exactly what to do, where to put that needle, how to put that needle. You got the needle in. Mm -hmm. How to wrap it, how to twist it, how to pull it off. And you have to do that, in this case, 67 times. Okay. And you can't lose a stitch. If you lose a stitch, there will be much weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, why do I tell you all of this? Why do I show you all my goodies? Because in the Bible, and I marked it, in Psalm 139, it tells us, it says in verse 14, uh, let's start at 13. You formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. So when God made you, he didn't just say, well, let's see, brown hair, long legs, sweaty nose, short fingers. Uh, let's see, what else can we put in there? Weird ears, let's put some glasses in there. I'm gonna shake it up and out comes Anna. That's not how that works. God knitted every little bit of you together. He knitted every little bit of me together. So that makes us very special people. Can't buy us anywhere. That's for sure. I'm going to say a prayer for you guys. And then you're going to skedaddle onto that thing you skedaddle onto. God, thank you so much for these children. Thank you for the time that they get to learn about you. I pray that as they go to learn about your ways and your power, that they would be in awe of you and that they would know how incredibly special they are, that they are made stitch by stitch uh, for a reason. And if they get a hole in themselves, God knows how to fix it. Thank you, Lord, that, that, that we can do this today. Thank you, Lord, that... Um, have this day every week to worship you. Pray these things in your son's precious name, Jesus Christ. Amen. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but it seems, I guess this question is directed more towards the guys. Guys, how many of you stink at introductions? Uh, I know I have done this a number of times. I've, I've had it done to me a number of times, and I've seen it happen a lot. There you are, you're, you're talking with someone, and, and your wife or your child, uh, friend, coworker are standing right next to you, and you do not introduce each other. I did it this past week when I was at the gym. I had said that, that Craig and Jimmy were going to help me get yoked. And so I was there at the, at the gym with Craig and, and I was talking with someone uh, from, from a previous church that I was at. I hadn't seen him in a couple of years. And there's Craig and there's this other guy and I just totally forgot, didn't even think to introduce them. Now, thankfully, Luke, as we're reading through the book of Acts, Luke is not as bad at these introductions as some of us are. In uh, Acts chapter 6, we are introduced to someone, actually we're introduced to a couple of different people, and while the one is only in the story for a very short time, his presence, as we will see, becomes very significant. So last week we were briefly introduced to this man, and uh, his name is Stephen. He was one of the seven men who were selected to make sure that the widows uh, who were Jewish but were from different parts of the Roman Empire, they were outside of Israel. He was one of these seven who were chosen to make sure that these widows were given their fair share of food in the daily distribution. 
And we mentioned last week that Stephen was also a Jew who lived outside of Israel. And this was one of the ways that the apostles decided uh, to, to deal with this food issue was to have those who noticed the issue, those who were impacted the most by it, they were the ones that were asked to handle it. You saw the problem, then go and fix it type of thing. And if you remember, I also said that though some people were called to do certain things for God, uh, speaking about Him, being His witness in this world, is something that we are all expected to do. And Stephen was no exception. So though he was tasked with making sure that people were fed, we're going to see how he was also expected to speak and witness for Christ. So over the rest of the passage that we're going to to read this morning, and then the chapter next week, what we're going to see is how Stephen lived this call out, that he wasn't there just to feed people, that he was there to speak about Christ. But Stephen, he, he actually serves in the Bible as a person of transition, because up to this point in Acts, uh, as, as we've read of the church reaching these Jewish people, uh, we've, what we've done is we've seen that the church is pretty much located just in Jerusalem. And God uses Stephen as a person to transition the church from Jerusalem to the world. We also see that Stephen kind of serves as the intermediary. Peter was the focus of the first uh, few chapters of Acts. But now what's going to happen is Peter and his story is going to diminish and Paul is going to become much greater. For the first five chapters of Acts, Peter is the dominant figure. After chapter five, and Peter begins to fade from the story, there are only a couple of times that he is mentioned, a few times in, in chapters 11 through 13. And then after 13, he only gets one more mention in the book of Acts. So Peter's presence in the story fades, Paul's becomes greater, and this person who served as the connection, because um, Stephen had a connection to Peter, and he also had a very significant connection to Paul. But it's not just in the overall story, though. Peter's main ministry, as I said, was uh, primarily in Jerusalem and to Jewish people. Paul's ministry was mainly to Gentiles. Um, Stephen's ministry was to Jewish people from Gentile lands. So in so many different ways, we can see Stephen as a person of transition. Peter's ministry was primarily in Jerusalem. Paul was throughout the entire Roman Empire. And Stephen's life, and I'm sorry I have to give the, the story away, his death is what causes the church to leave Jerusalem and begin to spread to the rest of the Roman Empire. And Stephen is the one that brings all of this about. So Stephen is a very significant person in Scripture, and he's significant for one other reason. Think of all of the great people of faith that we read of, of the apostles. Uh, you know, everyone from, like in the New Testament, everyone from the apostles and, and these others who have these stories and they just had this tremendous amount of faith. There is one thing that Stephen can claim apart from all of them, and that is that this person we're going to read about, Stephen, is the first Christian martyr. All of the apostles except John, were killed for their faith. But before they were killed, and even though we've already read of Peter and John being thrown into jail on a couple of different occasions because they would refuse to stop preaching in the name of Christ, they were all eventually freed. And since the Jewish leaders saw that, you know what, we keep throwing these two guys into jail and it's not working, what we're going to do is instead go for this one who maybe doesn't seem as significant, and we're going to use him as an example to the rest of the church. So Stephen, the one we're going to read about here today, is for all eternity known as the one, the first one, who believed in Christ enough that he was willing to die for it. But that's not all that made Stephen. 
uh, so significant. So if you will, please turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 6, uh, verses 8 through 15 is what we're going to read this morning. Acts chapter 6, 8 through 15, and we'll have the words up on the screen. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians, and of the Alexandrians, and of those from Kilikia in Asia, those who, uh, they rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly instigated men who said, we have heard him speak blasphem blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they set up false witnesses who said, This man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. So, in Stephen, uh, we see some, some characteristics that I pray uh, are going to be things that can come to describe who we are, the kind of Christians and the type of Christ-like behaviors that we would be able to exhibit. And we've already seen from the readings last week, we read there that Stephen was a man who was full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. And we needed to have these, or I'm sorry, he needed to have these characteristics in order to be selected as one of the ones who would help feed these widows and make sure that there was fair distribution of food. And this is kind of a preview of the next chapter here, but after the events that, that we've just read, Stephen is given the opportunity to defend himself. And that is what the bulk of chapter 7 covers. And in that defense, we see a number of things that reveal the content of his faith, what exactly he believes. And we will see that he believes that God is the ruler of all history. And that all of the events that have ever occurred in this world up to that point, and obviously everything after that, that they were brought about by God's design and activity throughout history. And so if God is in control of history, then he certainly should be in control of my life as well. And that's exactly what Stephen believed. He saw Jesus Christ as the fulfillment of hundreds of Old Testament prophecies about the coming Messiah. And he believed that Jesus had been risen to a place seated at the right hand of the Father, meaning that Jesus, the Son of God, is God. And as I alluded to earlier, Stephen's faith was great enough that he was able to trust in God then with his entire life. And this brings up a very significant point because you'll see this every once in a while on TV. When they talk about the, the early apostles and they talk about the church and they say things like, you know, most likely a lot of them, uh, they were lying. You know, that they, they stole Jesus' body, that he didn't actually rise up from the grave or anything like that. But when you stop and think about it, how many people are willing to die for a lie. And yet you had all of the apostles who had first, who would have had first-hand knowledge that Jesus Christ was a lie. And all of them, except John who died in prison, all of them were willing to die for it. Nobody dies for a lie like that. But many Christians today, uh, we are not able to be described in such a way as Stephen. Many Christians today think that, you know, God is removed from history. He's not actively involved in, in our lives. They may see that God is, uh, well, okay, he's supposed to rule over our lives, but we really never allow it or show it. 
And instead, what we get is this constant drone of, no, this is my right. I am entitled to, to, to do this. I deserve better than this. I shouldn't have to give this up. Oh, you know, that's just who I am type of thing. And instead of surrendering to God's lordship over us, we instead come up with all these excuses. Or we say that we are going to give up control of our lives to God, but in reality, the moment we give Him control, we try to take it right back. And we say that we believe that God is in control of all history, but we do not trust Him to be in control of our lives because He might ask us to do something really weird. And really, when you get down to it, what I'm concerned about is fulfilling the American dream. I want my house, I want my car, I want my one or two children, I want my retirement, I want my second house in the South. And that is what I work for. And if I'm lucky, then I will try to fit God into that somehow. Stephen was not that kind of believer. He not only trusted God with his eternal destiny, he trusted him enough with the concerns of his everyday life. And we're going to deal with that much more next week. So not only was Stephen full of faith, he was also full of the Holy Spirit. And that might sound like that comes from the office of redundancy office. But being full of, see you guys can catch that. You have to, you have to like stay on top of things here. I'm from the theory, you know. Office of Redundancy Office. There we go. So Stephen, being full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit, it can be two different things. Being full of faith means that one has uh, the, the faith to trust in God. Is God real? Yes, I believe He is real. Did He die for you? Yes, I believe He died for you. Do you believe that He hears you when you pray? Yes, I believe those things. Do you mostly try to live a life that honors him, either because you are scared of him or uh, the consequences that that disobedience would bring about, or because you believe that he has a desire and a will for you? Do you believe those things? Yes. Do you have faith in God that, um, that he has a will for you? Yes, I do. That is all faith. That is trusting in him. But being full of the Holy Spirit means that you actually obey His will fully. Stephen believed in God, and he also submitted to His authority in life. Because it would have been very easy for Stephen to say, no, I don't want to go and speak to this group, because if I do, most likely they're going to kill me. Instead, I'm just going to put my nose down, put my head down, not bother anybody, and just do my thing for 40 or 50 years so I can retire and move south and, and have, you know, experience the nice Jerusalem dream type of thing. He was full of faith. He was full of the Holy Spirit. And he was full of grace. Now, what does that mean? I served under a number of different pastors in my years of, of youth ministry. The first one was with a pastor and an associate pastor who showed very little grace to people. In their effort to be a leader and then train other people on the church staff, their quote-unquote helpfulness was really just them being critical. And there was hardly ever any grace shown to myself, the other youth pastor, the preschool teacher, the other people on the church staff. It was this constant barrage of, you know, Greg, you should have done this. Why didn't you say that? Boy, you really messed that one up. You need to learn this. And I am all for constructive criticism. But when it just becomes criticism, it gets very old very fast. So when someone on the staff had a moral failing, uh, this pastor and the associate pastor paraded this person before the entire congregation and then put him in limbo for a year saying, okay, he's kind of allowed to minister, but not really. And so after a year, we're going to figure out if we're going to fire him. When everybody knew, yeah, they're going to fire him. Now compare that with another pastor that I served with. And this man taught me a lot about showing grace. Some of it was intentional. He intentionally taught me 
how to show grace. And some of it was because there was a time that I did not want to serve with him. And it took a lot of grace on my part to remain as the youth director of that church. And what I learned from him was people who needed a lot of grace because of the things they have done, hopefully that translates into the ability to show grace to other people. Those who have grace bestowed upon them, we trust will show grace to other people. And so we, live, we see this lived out in Stephen's life. When he gives his life for the sake of the gospel, we see it in his willingness to serve those who could not help themselves. These Hellenistic Jewish widows who could not get their own food, they were unable to buy their own food. It became one of Stephen's ministries to care for these women and to show them the grace to take care of them and, and address their very real needs. And so finally, the last thing we see about Stephen's character, not finally for the sermon, we have a ways to go for that yet, this is just Stephen's character. Finally, for Stephen's character, the thing we see in this passage was that he was full of power. And we see in Stephen that he was closely linked with the apostles because he was able to show these different signs and wonders. And there were only a handful of people who could do such things in the church. Again, we have this picture that in the book of Acts, everybody in the church was running around healing people and showing signs and doing wonders, when in reality, uh, the people who were raising people from the dead, that were healing people on the spot, and had this uncanny insight into an issue, those people were the apostles, Stephen, Philip, and Barnabas. Those are the only ones that we read of in the book of Acts who could do these things. So the fact that Stephen was doing these things shows that he was uniquely chosen by God to put on display the power of the Holy Spirit inside of him. And so though we may not run around the eastern suburbs of Pittsburgh and do these same things, that power that enabled Stephen and Barnabas and Philip and, and the apostles to do those things that power is still in us. And so when it comes down to it, what we see is a righteous person does righteous things. A godly person produces godly fruit. If God has made a difference in your life, then you will be used by him to make a difference in the people's lives around you. So many times though, I hear people say things like, you know, I don't understand why God does not use me like he uses other people. And it kind of becomes this accusation against God. The reality, though, is that a righteous person does righteous things. So rather than accuse God of not using you, begin to look at yourself. What kind of fruit are you producing in life? Are you producing any fruit? And please understand one thing here. The fact that your children are quote-unquote good kids is not the kind of fruit that I'm talking about. I know many parents who are not Christians who have good kids. And the fact that you have good kids is kind of a selfish thing, isn't it? Like when you get right down to brass tacks, who wants a rotten child? What are you doing in the lives of people who cannot pay you back? like Stephen? How are you displaying the fruit of God's grace to people who cannot return the favor or gift? If the only place that you can look to to find fruit in your life is your family, then you are missing the point. If people outside of your family or your small circle of friends cannot speak of your godliness and grace that has been shown to them, then it is time to repent of selfishness and ask God to produce true righteous fruit in your life. Surrender to his will and let him put you 
you in situations where you can show that kind of grace to people. Start serving somewhere in the ministry of this church. Stop assuming that all of this is about you and start seeing people through the eyes of Christ and show them the grace that each and every one of us is looking for. That is righteous fruit. That is the kind of fruit that only God produces in, in the lives of an obedient Christian. Now, another characteristic that stands out in these verses in regards to Stephen's faith was that he lived his faith out with courage. Verses 9 through 14, we read of what Stephen uh, was, was up against for sharing the gospel of Christ. We see that there were a number of synagogues that came against him with different accusations. And they made up these accusations uh, or things that, that Stephen had said and they took them out of context. And this is one of those areas in which many Christians do not understand, really to understand what's happening here, we have to understand what Judaism was like in the time of Christ. Many of us tend to think that everything happened in the temple. But according to the Talmud, the Talmud were these writings um, from, from the time of Christ, before Christ, even after Christ a while. They're kind of the founding documents of modern day Judaism. According to parts written around the time of Christ, there were 480 synagogues just in Jerusalem. So again, stop thinking that everything happened at the temple. Most everything happened in these synagogues. So what you have are synagogues all throughout Jerusalem, and they appeal to a certain type of person or experience or location. It's just like churches today. There were different types of synagogues in Jesus' day, and you have heard me say countless times that a person can be redeemed, a person can be changed, but people, plural, never change. And looking back 2,000 years ago, what we see is a segment, segmenting of the religious institutions based on things that are fairly insignificant. So it seems that there were at least three different synagogues that have come against Stephen in this story. We see this first one, the synagogue of the freedmen. This was a synagogue uh, of, of former slaves and their families. But it wasn't just any slaves because, you know, I don't want to associate with those slaves. I want to be with my slaves type, type, type of thing, just like churches today. These particular slaves were, were captured by Pompeii in 63 BC. And they were then taken to Rome. And then they were granted their freedom and their children and grandchildren set up this synagogue in Jerusalem for when their families would travel to Jerusalem. And so we see that synagogue, and we see a synagogue of the Cyrenians and the Alexandrians. Now this particular synagogue was for Jewish people who traveled from two of the major cities of Northern Africa. Do we have the map, Jimmy? Do we have that come through? Um, just to kind of help put things into perspective. Uh, we need it, there we go, even bigger if we can. That's good. Okay, uh, go. We want to see Northern Africa, so go down. And uh, there we go. Okay. So, right about here is the city of Cyrene. Uh, right about here would be Alexandria. So, these two cities, uh, when people would travel from there into Palestine, uh, Jerusalem, they would have these different synagogues set up for them to travel to. Um, if you, you might hear that, that name Cyrene and think, well, why have I heard that before? Because Simon, who carried Jesus' cross, was from Cyrene. And if you hear Alexandria, you think, why have I heard that before? Because one of the seven wonders of the ancient world was in uh, Alexandria, the, the large lighthouse. And then interestingly enough, the third synagogue present was from uh, this territory here called Kilikia, and another one from this one, which in Greek is Asaia. Now here's where it gets really confusing, again, for us, because we see Asia, 
And what had happened was Asia was a territory of Rome that eventually came to explain or label all of the continent. So it was the first territory-ish coming over from, from Rome over here. So they would hit Asia and all of this then became Asia. But we have a synagogue for people from Asia and one from Kilikia. Now right about here in Kilikia was this town um, that, that should be familiar to, to a few of us. Um, there was someone from that town that we are going to read about in the next chapter that's very poignant to the rest of the story of Acts. In that part of Kilikia was this town called Tarsus. And there was a certain person from Tarsus that when he would travel to Jerusalem to be in the synagogue, he most likely was a part of the synagogue from Kilikia. So what I'm doing is I'm talking about Paul. And so Paul very likely was a part of this group of people um, who were, were questioning Stephen at this point that we just read. Uh, and it's very possible that he was the one that was there. And that it's also very possible as we read in verse 10, here's Paul who's this learned man who becomes one of the greatest Christians, the most um, effective communicator in all of Christianity. And here he is trying to argue with this nobody, Stephen. And it says this, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. So these words used, you know, to, to dispute with Stephen, it's closer to an debate to a debate than it is an argument. How many times, though, do we lose our passion for people in our lives? We speak of God, but we do it as if He is only an idea or a philosophy, or you know, maybe God's like a really good movie, and we just talk about Him and then we go on. How often are we more passionate about the Steelers, or Star Wars versus Star Trek, or Marvel versus DC? How often are we more passionate about making sure that everybody says Merry Christmas? How often are we more passionate about making sure that everybody stands for the flag or that Republican or Democrat or conservative or liberal, and we are all more willing to be super uh, passionate about those things, but when it comes to speaking passionately about Christ and His offer of salvation and forgiveness to people, then all of a sudden, all of us, many of us, we become, even if we are the most vocal person, all of a sudden we get quiet. Oh, that's a personal thing. Stephen had the courage to stand up to all of his, uh, of his accusers and we will see next week exactly what they had to say to what he had to say to them. But knowing that these may well have been his final words, he was courageous enough to not let his spirit or the gospel be quenched. 
And I pray that we would all have that same kind of courage to speak the things about God that Stephen did, that our church, our neighbors, our city, our state, our country, our world would be so much different if we would just be willing to courageously speak the gospel of Christ in the people's lives. And finally, verse 15, we see in Stephen a man who has transitioned into something otherworldly. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. What those who are accusing him saw in Stephen was not the face of evil, but one that radiated God's holiness and glory. Because when we live lives in which our character reflect the grace and the power and the faith and the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and when we live lives in which we courageously, by faith in Christ, say what our faith is and why we do these things, something happens and we begin to change from being all about ourselves and instead living for God. Instead of people seeing us, they see Christ in us. When they see us or when they hear what we did this past weekend and they see the evidence of the grace of Christ in our lives and it's being lived out among, you know, for them to see, they are attracted to that. To put it simply, nobody comes to Christ because of you or me. In fact, I would say that most people, that everybody comes to Christ despite me. They do it because they see Christ, and that is who they want in their lives. There have been many times that I have seen this lived out, where I have seen Christ in the actions of people, and I have heard Him in their words. There was a time in my life when I saw this lived out in someone's life. I had just come to Christ, and I was attending this church, and the church I was at thought it would be a very good idea for me to begin dis uh, discipling with an older businessman. Now, this guy had children that were older than I was at the time. He was retired. He was a very successful businessman. He had left that, and now he was serving as an elder in his church, in addition to serving in many ministries throughout the church and community. And one of the things that he would do is he would bring me along uh, when he had the opportunity to speak at local uh, men's homeless shelters and also at the jail. He'd take me there. And after going there a few times, his name was Chuck, he gave me the first opportunity to speak before people about the hope and the gospel of Christ. And it was, so the first time I had an opportunity to, in essence, share my heart about what Christ has done, it was given to me by Him. And I loved it. But when I saw His compassion, as He would encourage these men to continue on with their walk in Christ, when I saw the way that He loved His wife and children, when I, I took notice that here was this guy, a retired businessman, been a Christian all of his life, and here he is meeting with some long-haired, freaky drummer, 19-year-old kid, and he treated me as a human being and sought to model for me what it means to be a man of God. I saw in him Christ. No, his face never shone like an angel. In fact, his face reminded me a lot of uh, Howard Cunningham. That's probably one of the reasons why I really liked him. Because, you know, I think for a lot of us, if we could ever choose a father, it was Mr. C, you know, type of thing. So I really appreciated him uh, for that. He never looked like it. happy days for all you young people. Okay. <laughs> um, his face never shone like that of an angel, but Christ living in him and using him in my life and in other people's lives, he made Christ abundantly clear. So is that in your life? Do people see you or do they see Christ? This week, this is just an introduction to Stephen, and I pray that you can see in him some things that would inspire you to greater faith. And I pray that in him, that we would see the kind of faith that we want to live out ourselves. 
that we would be able to see and model a faith that is defined by characteristics of great faith and great power and great grace and the presence of the Holy Spirit and that those things would be lived out and spoken courageously even to the point of facing death where I have to give up everything in order to get this off of my chest to say what it is that the Holy Spirit has given me and I am now speaking of Christ that in all things that we do when we are living out our faith that people would see Christ in us that they would see his glory and his honor in our actions and in our words Visit us on the web at www.rollinghillschurch.today or drop in for a visit at 120 Garner Drive, Verona, PA, 15147. Service time is 10 a.m. on Sunday. Send us a message via email to rollinghillsbaptist at comcast.net or reach us by phone at 412-795-1133.